Psalm 10.1 says, Why standest thou afar off, O Lord? Why hidest thou thyself in times of trouble? The wicked in his pride doth persecute the poor. Let them be taken of the devices they've imagined. For the wicked boasteth of his heart's desire, and blesseth the covetous whom the Lord abhorreth. The wicked, through the pride of his countenance, will not seek after God. God is not at all in his thoughts. His ways are always grievous. Thy judgments are far above out of his sight. As for all his enemies, he puffeth at them. He hath said in his heart, I shall not be moved, for I shall never be in adversity. His mouth is full of cursing and deceit and fraud. Under his tongue is mischief and vanity. He sitteth in the lurking places of the villages. In the secret places doth he murder the innocent. His eyes are privately set against the poor. Heavenly Father, bless. I pray the reading of your word, the preaching to follow. Lord, let it be exactly what you desire for the moment. And I pray that you'd use me and help me as I break forth your word. These things I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. We're given neither the author nor the time frame for the psalm. What we are given, though, is a clear view of what was on the psalmist's heart as he looked at society around him. The author of this psalm was asking God to intervene in some horrible things that were happening. When I say that he was asking God to intervene, I don't mean that he was asking God to speak softly and winsomely to the hearts of the wicked and woo them to the truth. Look at verse 15 again. He said, Break thou the arm of the wicked and the evil man. Seek out his wickedness till thou find none. Seems incredibly harsh, but it was also incredibly appropriate. Look again at verse 8 and you'll understand why. It says, He sitteth in the lurking places, the villages, in the secret places doth he murder the innocent. The psalmist looked at the wicked world around him and he saw that those wicked people in that wicked world were murdering the innocent. And his response was to say, God break their arms and keep after them till there's no wickedness left to deal with whatsoever. This thing of murdering the innocent has always been abhorrent both to God and to the people that actually know God. It's always brought condemnation and judgment. In Genesis chapter 4, verse 9 through 12, the Bible says, And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And now art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shall thou be in the earth. 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 9 and 10, speaking of David's great sin with Bathsheba, God through the prophet said, Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with a sword, and hast taken his wife to be thy wife, and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house. The murder of the innocents will never be acceptable in God's sight. So why don't we talk for a little while about what's currently on most everybody's mind anyway, the potential fall of Roe versus Wade. Let me say something right up front before any hearts are broken or spirits needlessly crushed. There are probably people in this room right now who before you got saved and before you knew better had an abortion. And if you've asked God to forgive you, it is forgiven and forgotten forever. Under the blood and God no longer holds it against you. You are as clean as the wind-driven snow in his sight on this matter. So what I'm going to be saying for the next little while is not in any way designed to hurt you or make you feel guilty. It's merely designed to tell the truth and to save lives now and to keep others from making the horrible choices that you once made. Last week when I saw a tweet that said, SCOTUS justice has ruled to overturn Roe v. Wade, I initially dismissed it as just another internet rumor. But then I saw it from somebody else, and then from somebody else, and soon the news was reporting it as well. If reports are correct, it seems that five justices are currently set to overrule that horribly reasoned case and send the issue back to the states. And currently, though it's against federal law, Protesters are targeting conservative justices at their home to try to scare them out of deciding that particular way. Naturally, unsurprisingly, the Biden Justice Department is intentionally sitting on their hands and doing nothing and actually overtly encouraging that harassment. But that satanic sinfulness is the subject for another day. For today, especially since individual states may be deciding very soon what they'll do with abortion, we need to go over the subject from God's Word and from logic and even from science. Roe v. Wade absolutely needs to fall. 
we need to advocate for that fall. And then when it gets to our state, we need to make sure that that abominable evil remains illegal here. The title of this message is, Roe Has Got to Go. First of all, let's look at the biblical case against abortion. Go to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. First thing I want you to see is that God made life and specifically made man in his image, and into man alone breathed the breath of life. Genesis 1, 26 and 27, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And then in Genesis 2, 7 we read, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Let me put it plainly. We're not like the animals. We're not more advanced animals. We're not more highly evolved animals. We're, we're, we're not animals at all. Have you ever stopped to look at the gap between man and animals? It seems like, like as animals... Man will be at the top of the food chain, but that there'll be something else pretty near to us and something else pretty close under that. But it isn't like that. I mean, not even close. Think of the highest accomplishments of the animal kingdom. Building a better nest. Monkey learns a few words of sign language. That's it. It's the best they got. Now compare that with the highest accomplishments of man. Artificial hearts splitting and harnessing the power of the atom, sending probes all across our solar system and beaming pictures back, putting men on the moon, hyperbaric chambers to heal wounds, electron microscopes. It is light years difference. There's no comparison. God made us in his image. God infused us with a potential second only to God himself. Say, preacher, you're overstating that. That sounds almost blasphemous. I'm giving you what Scripture said. Genesis 11, 6. Genesis 11, 6. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one. They have all one languages, and this they all one language, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they've imagined to do. That can't be said of any animal at all. Human life, because it's made in the image of God, and because God breathed into man's nostrils the breath of life, is sacred. By the way, when you take that belief away, can I, can I show you what you end up with? Let me give you a little bit of a quote here. Human babies are not born self-aware or capable of grasping that they exist over time. They are not persons. With animals being self-aware, the life of a newborn is of less value than the life of a pig, a dog, or a chimpanzee. A period of 28 days after birth might be allowed before an infant is accepted as having the same right to live as others. That's a quote from Peter Singer professor of bioethics at Princeton University Center for Human Values. He actually advocates for parents to have the right to kill their babies up to 28 days after they're already born. You want to know why people are killing each other in the streets of Chicago and committing mass murder in Las Vegas? Well, why wouldn't they be? If human life isn't sacred, why not? If we're all the byproducts of random chance, why not? If we're just a higher form of animals, why not? Human life has no value anymore because the source of that value has been taken away from an entire society. The only source of any value we have is that we are the special creation of God. If that isn't true, then we're nothing more than cosmic accidents. But if human life is sacred, then we're not cosmic accidents. And if human life is sacred and we're not cosmic accidents, then abortion is the willful destruction of a person that God has made in his own image for his own purpose. Then I want you to understand, Jeremiah chapter 1, that God specifically speaks of his plans for people while they're still babes in the womb. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 1 through 5 the words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priests that were in Anathoth in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the thirteenth year of his reign. It came also in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, unto the end of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, unto the carrying away of Jerusalem, captive in the fifth month. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, and before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations." God had a plan for Jeremiah, and he ordained him to that plan while he was still a babe in the womb. God told Jeremiah that he knew him even in the womb. Has it ever dawned on you that every time an abortion is committed, God already knows the name of that child? 
The parent likely hasn't even picked a name out because all he or she wanted to do is get rid of that child. But God says, you just killed Sally. You just killed Thomas. You just killed Malia. You just killed Jeb. I had a plan for that child's life. You say, but what if I hadn't even planned on getting pregnant? What if it even happened through a rape? Well, we'll cover more about that in just a bit. But for now, let me say that that's a horrible, unimaginable thing. Nobody should ever have to go through that. And if rapists were consistently and quickly put to death like they should be, there wouldn't be many rapes at all. But how the child was conceived is not the child's fault. And if a child's conceived, even in that horrible way, God is such a good God that he'll have a plan even for that child's life, and he'll even know that child's name. Then look at Luke chapter 1, number 3. I want you to see that God specifically demonstrates the personhood of babes in the womb. Look at a couple of verses regarding John the Baptist. Luke chapter 1 verse 15 says, For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. Drop down to verse 41. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. And she spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And whence is this to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded, in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. In the womb, John was filled with the Holy Ghost. In the womb, John recognized the Messiah being carried by another lady in the room. In the womb, John leaped for joy. You know what you call something that can be filled with the Holy Ghost and recognize people and leap for joy? You call that a person. And then next I want you to see that God gave a simple command. Thou shalt not kill. It's found in Exodus chapter 20, verse 13, by the way. It's one of the Ten Commandments. And he was clearly speaking not of self-defense or capital punishment, both of which are allowed by Scripture, but of murder, the taking of an innocent human life. That's exactly what we find in Psalm 10.8, our text. We are not to put the innocent to death. Abortion kills a living person. Abortion violates the Sixth Commandment. 18 days after conception, abortion literally stops a beating heart. For real Christians, all this biblical truth is enough. It's an innocent living being we're dealing with, and God said not to kill it. So we see the biblical case against abortion. But then let me show you the biased, crooked arguments for abortion. Now this dark sacrament that the lost world loves, and please don't quibble with my description of it there, the satanic temple literally just announced that they're filing suit claiming that abortion is a vital part of their worship. You know, if you're on the same side as Satan... That may be a hint that you're on the wrong side, possibly. So this dark sacrament that the lost world loves is something that they vehemently argue for. But their arguments are biased and crooked. They're biased in that they are self-serving and have an agenda behind them. And they're crooked in that they're utterly invalid and untrue. So let me give you the most common ones and tell you why they're so wrong. The first one obviously is, my body, my choice. We hear that a lot in regard to abortion, don't we? The only problem is, it's not just biblically and logically inaccurate, it's completely scientifically inaccurate. That body inside your body is someone else's body. It doesn't belong to you. That tiny heart beating in there isn't your heart. Those tiny toes and fingers in there aren't your fingers and toes. That tiny circulatory system isn't your circulatory system. You have a brand new, completely individual human being living and being nourished inside of you. Now, you may be really angry with God or biology, depending on your point of view, about the arrangement, but it is what it is. Humanity survives from one generation to the next because new humans grow in the womb of older humans until they are born. They spend nine months of life riding around in someone else, then the rest of their life out of that someone else. But at no point is that baby the mother. From the very moment of conception, they are two completely distinct individuals. At the very second of conception, a new human life forms. It has its own DNA completely separate from that of mommy or daddy. At 18 days, its heart starts to beat at about 140 beats per minute. At 21 days, it has its own blood type. At 28 days, eyes and ears begin to form. At 42 days, the skeleton is complete and reflexes are present. At 12 weeks, they have fingers and toes. At 23 weeks, they start dreaming. They may be in you... But they're not you. That child is its own person from moment one. Can can I make some logical analogies here? You don't have the right to bite off the fingers of your dentist because those fingers are in your mouth. You don't have the right 
to cut off the hand of the OBGYN that is checking things out, and, 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 you'll get, and if you get arrested, you don't have the right to cut off the hand of the officer who's doing a cavity check because you decided to hide the crack in the crack. <laughs> someone, someone does not become you or even part of you just because they're temporarily residing in you. <laughs> You'll remember that illustration, won't you? <laughs> Location does not determine personhood or lack thereof. You don't have to like the arrangement, but you don't get to make up facts that aren't true. It's not your body. The second argument is, men shouldn't have any say-so in this issue. Really? Really? Because if men shouldn't have a say-so in this issue, then Roe v. Wade is already a moot point. It was a ruling that was decided and handed down by seven men. So which is it? If men shouldn't have any say-so in abortion, then Roe needs to be overturned since all men decided it. And if they should have a say in this issue, then Roe still needs to be overturned since it's a mixture of both men and women justices set to overturn it. And by the way, don't you find it more than just a little bit ironic that just a few weeks ago there were trans-favorable news stories all over the place saying, yes, men can get pregnant too. Those stories went quiet in a hurry when the Roe v. Wade thing came up, didn't they? Apple has now even given us a pregnant man emoji. But it really doesn't seem to have been used much since this road leak came out. Isn't it funny how science is nothing more than a flag waving in the breeze these days, whichever way the breeze happens to be blowing at the moment? Furthermore, a large percentage of women in the United States identify as being pro-life and have been working to overturn Roe v. Wade for years. This isn't just a man issue. It's an everybody with an actual heart issue. The next argument they give is, Christians aren't really pro-life. They're just pro-birth. They don't care about kids once they're born. That's what's called a red herring fallacy. It's an attempt to divert attention away from the actual issue, which is that innocent babies are actually being put to death. It's also patently untrue. Christians do take in unwanted children in huge numbers. Every church I know, including this one, has large numbers of family who have adopted, fostered, or simply taken children in and raised them without even having official custody of them. Christians also generously fund crisis pregnancy centers and other organizations that help young mothers be able to keep and raise their own children. And ironically, pro-abortion protesters have been burning down crisis pregnancy centers this week, the very places that are giving mothers diapers and formula and clothes and money so they can take care of their children. If any side of the equation doesn't care about mothers and children, it's the pro-abortion side, not the pro-life side. You want to know who the bad guys are? They're the ones burning down the pregnancy centers, not the ones building the pregnancy centers. The next argument is, if it is unwanted, it isn't a child. If it's wanted, it is a child. That's literally, legitimately what they believe and openly state. If a woman gets pregnant and is happy and wants what is in her womb, it's a baby in there. But if a woman gets pregnant and is not happy and does not want what is in her womb, it's just a clump of cells, a blob of tissue. Is it even really necessary for me to explain how ludicrous and unscientific that is? Things are what they are whether you want them or not. Your want has absolutely nothing to do with it. If you want a hemorrhoid for some weird reason, it's a hemorrhoid. If you don't want a hemorrhoid, it's still a hemorrhoid all the same. You can go to the doctor and say, well, doc, it's not really a hemorrhoid because I don't want it. And all that's going to happen is he's going to look at you like you're stupid because you are. If you want 2020 vision, 2020 vision is 2020 vision. If you don't want 2020 vision, 2020 vision is still 2020 vision. If you want that baby in your womb, it's a baby. If you don't want the baby in your womb, it's still a baby. Want has absolutely nothing to do with it. Want is hallmark, not science. Yeah. Next argument they give is this one. Until it's able to survive on its own, it isn't really a person. You sure you want to go there? Because if you get into a wreck next week and have to be put on machines for a few days until your body can recover, you aren't able to survive on your own at that point. Do we have the right to go ahead and kill you? A young man in this church got into a motorcycle wreck several years ago. He was in the hospital on a ventilator for three weeks. He absolutely could not survive on his own. And then his body finally got strong enough to come off the ventilator. He walked out of the hospital. He's alive and well to this day. How about a perfectly healthy six-month-old baby? That's absolutely not able to feed itself and tend to itself. 
It'll most certainly die without parents tending to it 24-7. I almost hesitate to ask if it's okay to go ahead and kill those because I suspect a large percentage of the pro-abortion crowd would enthusiastically shout, Yes! How about somebody who's wading in the ocean and gets sucked out by a riptide, can't swim, and is drowning? They certainly can't survive on their own, so can we take them out with a sniper shot from the lifeguard tower? Try that one out with the police. Well, he couldn't survive on his own, so it was okay for me to go ahead and, and snipe him. You're going down for murder, and rightfully so. How about somebody who's in a burning house and has passed out due to smoke inhalation? They certainly can't survive on, on, on their own. So should we send firemen after, in after them to rescue them or just laugh and roast marshmallows? You see how ludicrous it is to say until a person is able to survive on its own, it's not a person. It's not science, it's stupidity. Another argument that will just blow you away is this. The Bible talks about the breath of life. So until it breathes its first breath, it really isn't alive. That's a really common canard these days. In fact, on September 6, 2019, Pete Buttigieg, the former mayor of, of uh, South Bend, Indiana, now Joe Biden's transportation secretary, who, by the way, has had no experience in transportation whatsoever, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, Pete Buttigieg made that exact argument. He made the argument that a baby's not a baby until it breathes the breath of life. So let's deal with that just for a minute because what he's trying to quote is Genesis 2, 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed in his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. Now the first thing you need to remember is that no one in all of human history came into being the way that Adam and Eve did. They're the only two humans who did not grow in the womb and come into the world through a birthing canal to use their experience to try and prove that a baby is not alive until it inhales air to take, uh, to take its breath is utterly unique and never again repeated experience of Adam and Eve to try to apply that to the lives of all the other tens of billions of humans who came into the world the normal way in this, in this never repeated way. That is ludicrous. You also need to know that babies in the womb do have the breath of life in them. They just get it a different way. Let me read you a short bit of a column from Medical News Today. After five to six weeks of pregnancy, the umbilical cord develops to deliver oxygen directly to the developing fetus's body. The umbilical cord connects to the placenta, which is connected to the uterus. Both structures house many blood vessels and continue to grow and develop throughout pregnancy. Together, the umbilical cord and placenta deliver nutrients from the mother to the baby. They also provide the baby with the oxygen-rich blood necessary for growth. This means that the mother breathes in for the baby and the oxygen in her blood is then transferred to the baby's blood. The mother also breathes out for the baby as carbon dioxide from the baby is moved out through the placenta to the mother's blood, then removes the exhale. They do have the breath of life in them. It's get it another way. Furthermore, have you realized the implications of what Mayor Pete suggested? You know how long it takes a baby on average to breathe their first breath after they're born? Ten seconds. So follow this. According to his reasoning, what he's saying is a baby can be born be right there on the table, and you can go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and then take a gun and blow his brains out. And you didn't kill a baby because it didn't get that first breath in. That's satanic. It's biased and it's crooked and it doesn't stand up under any kind of, cert of, of scrutiny, much less scientific scrutiny. Then there's this argument. But what about rape and incest? Now, as I've said, that's a horrible, unimaginable thing. Nobody should ever have to go through that. And if rapists were consistently and quickly put to death like they should be, there wouldn't be much of that. But how the child was conceived is not the child's fault. But what you really need to know is that those who bring up rape and incest when trying to defend abortion are being absolutely disingenuous, and they know it. Just 1% of women obtain an abortion because they say they became pregnant through rape and less than 0.5% do so because of incest according to the incest because of the Guttmacher Institute. That means 98.5% of abortions have nothing to do with rape or incest. They're simply matters of choice. And if the pro-life side said, okay, we'll compromise. If the child is conceived by rape or incest and you press charges against whoever did it, we'll allow that abortion as long as you do not allow abortion the other 98.5% of the time, you know good and well the pro-aborts would never go along with it. I know it, you know it, and they know it. Abortion's not about rape or incest to them. It's about getting to do whatever you want to do and there not being any consequences that you have to face for it. And then there's one that I truly love. You're a racist and a white supremacist if you stand against abortion. I really love this one. One of the reasons I love it is because as Thomas Sowell, the brilliant black author and one of my personal heroes so eloquently wrote, the word racism is like ketchup. It can be put on practically anything, and demanding evidence makes you a racist. Another reason I love it, 
is because somebody helped me prove it this morning. My column this week is about this. Roe v. Wade showed up in the Chattanooga paper this morning. First email of the day. Mind you, my, my column's about abortion. Does not mention race at all. First email of the day from a guy named William. Bo, so tired of you and your white nationalist reformative Christianity. God says he'll spew out hypocrites like you. I pray God does just that. Look at me. Does this perfect tan year round look like the face of white supremacy to you? Don't call the brown dude a white supremacist. Can we do that? <laughs> they just, throw, just throw words around. Pray God spews you out of his mouth. <laughs> Another reason I love this is because it's an excellent example of the fact that whatever the left accuses someone of is invariably what they themselves are 100% guilty of. Margaret Sanger, the founder of Planned Parenthood, the organization that has contributed to more than 60 million deaths of innocent babies in America, was an absolute racist. She started Planned Parenthood to try and eliminate or at least severely diminish the black race. And to this day, abortion clinics disproportionately target poor black neighborhoods. The abortion industry kills an estimated 649 pre-born black babies every single day. Black women account for 38% of all U.S. abortions, even though, they make up, even though black Americans make up just 12% of the U.S. population. So don't tell me that being against abortion is racist. What is racist is being the white liberal who is in favor of abortion, knowing doggone good and well it'll be the black babies that die instead of yours. That's the racism. But there's one more, and it's my personal favorite. Jesus would be in favor of abortion. Listen to a few words from this column titled, A Pastor's Case from the Morality of Abortion, in the Atlantic, May 26, 2019. Jess Cass, a minister of the United Church of Christ, believes the procedure should be fully legal and accessible. There's this little passage in the Gospel of John that continues to stay with me, Jess says. I've, co I've come that they might have life and, and have it abundantly. The Greek word that's used here for life abundance is this word zoe, which means not just that you're living and breathing, but that God's plan for our lives is actually to have a meaningful life with loving contentment and satisfaction. Because of that, because I value life and I believe Jesus values life, I value the choices that give us the type of life we need. Are you getting that pretzel twisting level of reasoning? She's saying that she's in favor of abortion because Jesus wants us to have a wonderful, comfortable life. So Jesus would be in favor of abortion too. Of course, this is, this is really interesting since Jesus in John 15, 3 said, Greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. This woman wants you to believe that the Jesus who died so that others could live would want you to kill so that you could live more abundantly. It's heresy and blasphemy. The same Jesus, by the way, also said in Matthew 18, 6, But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believed in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depths of the sea. Jesus had a soft spot in his heart for children, but I see nowhere that he had any kind of a soft spot for self-centered, narcissistic, bloodthirsty adults who would kill children for their own stinking benefit so that they could live more abundantly. So-called preachers are like that everywhere. Episcopal priest Mike Kinman said last week that he put up a banner on the building of the All Saints Church in Pasadena reading, Abortion is Health Care, after consulting with his local Planned Parenthood on how best to respond to the leaked Supreme Court opinion which would overturn Roe v. Wade. He, he said that the revolutionary Jesus wants this. He said, he said we need to talk to our children about abortion. Where do even begin? I suppose we could first of all begin with a warning for the Bible about certain ministers. It's found in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13 through 15. You better go over there real quick. You're, you're probably going to see this. You might not even believe it's in there, but it is. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13 through 15. This, this guy's in the Bible. Both of these ministers, they're, they're actually in the Bible. I'm going to read you about them. 2 Corinthians 11, 13 through 15 says, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ, and no marvel... 
For Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his, Satan's, ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. In case you didn't understand that, let me spell it out for you very plainly. The devil has not tried to stamp the church out. He's gone full force into the church business. And this Episcopal priest and countless others like him are on his payroll. They are his ministers. Secondly, to call our blessed Savior the revolutionary Jesus and then apply it in such a way as to make it seem like he's in favor of your dark sacrament that the satanic temple itself adores is an absolute blasphemy. Abortion is nothing more than Molech worship reborn for the modern day, the destruction of children for the worship of a false god. So I'd very much appreciate it if you'd not try to drag my Jesus into that mess. Thirdly, how dare you try to talk to children about what Jesus would be okay with when you think he'd be okay with destroying the very children that you're talking to. Leave our kids alone. Fourthly, abortion is health care like rape is intimacy. They're not even close to the same thing. No, Jesus is not okay with abortion. No amount of scripture twisting from you will make it so. So we see the biblical case against abortion, the bias, crooked arguments for abortion. Then number three, the breathtaking cost of abortion. Now, when I speak of the breathtaking cost of abortion, please understand I'm not talking about how much abortion costs. It's undeniably a money racket. There's no question about that whatsoever. An abortion costs up to $750 in the first trimester, up to $1,500 later in pregnancy. Those are not figures from some fundamentalist website. They're directly from Planned Parenthood. Also directly from Planned Parenthood is this. Most in-clinic abortions take about 5 to 10 minutes. You running the math on that? On the low side, an abortionist makes $4,500 an hour. On the high side, $15,000 an hour. You want to know why they're advocating so hardly, harshly for it? You want to know why they're screaming, asking for it to stay in place? You want to know why they love it so much? $15,000 an hour will do that to you. A doctor really makes very little per hour for bringing a child into this world, but an abortionist makes a very literal killing by taking children out of this world. Abortion is a $3.4 billion per year industry. And that's exactly what it is, is an industry. And yet while all that's true, it's still not what I'm talking about when I speak of the breathtaking cost of abortion. I'm talking about the cost to the soul and general welfare of a society. Proverbs 14.34 says, Righteousness exalts the nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. America has the blood of 63 million innocent babes slaughtered in the womb on its hands. That's an abject reproach to us, and God will not let it go unrecompensed. Furthermore, all this has come at an incredibly high price to the family. A lady on Twitter the day after the Roe v. Wade possibly being overturned Lee came out lamented this, quote, Just be aware, this is going to devastate hookup culture. Look me in the eyeballs. Good! Good! It needs to. Hookup culture, this idea that sex is nothing but a cheap activity that can be completely separated from commitment, is destroying children and homes. Let me give you some data from the Census Bureau. In 1960, 8% of children lived in a single-parent home with that parent being the mother. As of 2016, that number had nearly tripled with 23% of children living in single-parent homes with that parent being the mother. And to show the actual racism of it all once again, the percentage of white children under 18 who live with both parents almost doubles that of black children, according to the data. While 74.3% of all white children below the age of 18 live with both parents, only 38.7% of African-American minors can say the same. Instead, more than one-third of all black children in the United States under the age of 18 live with unmarried mothers compared to 6.5% of white children. That figures reflect a general trend. During the 1960 to 2016 period, the percentage of children living with only their mother nearly tripled from 8 to 23%. percent percentage of children living with only their father increased from 1 to 4%. What am I saying? I'm saying that once men realize they could have sex without having to worry about the nuisance of hanging around to raise a child, the family fell apart and the black family was particularly hard hit. Women who have had abortions overwhelmingly say that the men who fathered those children pressured them to abort those babies. According to a study recently published in the Journal of American Physicians and Surgeons, nearly 75% of the 987 American women who participated in an after-abortion survey admitted they experienced at least subtle forms 
forms of pressure to terminate their pregnancies. Two other findings are significant. Nearly 60% of the women indicated they decided to abort in order to make others happy. And almost 30% of those surveyed admit that they were afraid they would lose their partner if they didn't abort their pregnancies. You talk about men not having a say. What about this? Because men are the ones having the say in this. Men are the ones driving the abortion industry so that they can continue to do what they do and continue to not have to pay for a child that they have to raise. Every child ought to be able to grow up with a mother and a father and the abortion industry has ruined that model in the pursuit of the next billion dollars and the next billion and the next billion. And as a result, men can have sex and run and women are left to abort their baby or to raise it alone. You listen to me real carefully. There's nothing good that comes from abortion. Nothing. It's a sin. It's a stain on the soul of this nation. It's an abomination in the sight of God. And it's a sacrament of Satan. Don't ever have one. Don't ever speak of it in a positive light. And don't ever vote for any money-hungry, bloodlust-filled politicians who advocate for it. Roe has got to go.